Okay, so welcome back to our third session um, of today after a very um, lively lunch. Uh, I had the feeling that we could have stayed longer and discussed uh, with colleagues. I think we, we had a very interesting discussion in the morning and it gave us some, some general idea what what we are talking about, um, about the investments, the problems that emerge with regard to, sus uh, to sustainable development. And I think we got many insights. But what I was missing, and that is why we have this panel now, was answers how these investments can be translated into s sustainable development. What kind of investments, what kind of infrastructure do we need for sustainable development? And then how, how are concrete projects translated into better life for people? What are the mechanisms? And I think we have three excellent panelists here who will give us insights from individual countries, uh, but also their experience from, from other places, uh, other countries, um, so they've got a comparative um, perspective uh, as well. Um, let me start at my right with presenting um, the panelists. And actually, you've got so impressive, impressive CVs. Uh, excuse me if I don't um, report everything. Um, to my right, uh, you find Uso Ekbuche. She is a sustainability consultant for the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Um, uh, it's one of Nigeria's, Nigeria's largest private sector platforms, and they are involved in job creation, a topic that emerged this morning as, as well. She also chairs the International Union for Conservation of, Nat uh, of uh, Nature in the Niger Delta panel, and she is a pioneer advocate for the World Bank and holds a doctorate in degree in zoology from the University of Chos in Nigeria. Very well, warm welcome. <laughs> to my uh, far right, you see Tunzi Mbwaba. You are founder and chief executive officer of Zoro IBC, a global deal facilitation business and commodity trader. And you, you're you serving in, in several important boards as president, member, uh, for instance, you're vice president for Africa of the International Organization of Employers in Geneva, board member of the IOE, and um, a chairman of the University of the Western Cape. You're also involved in the International Labor Organization. But actually, I have to admit, um, I was most fascinated by the fact um, that you're the first man ever, the first man ever, to board the Business Women's Association of South Africa. So <laughs> maybe... Invited by the women. Maybe, maybe that's not the top... Well, we, we will talk about participative and inclusive processes. <laughs> So um, if we don't manage to talk about it on the panel, I'd really like to be interested <laughs> to know after the panel how, th how that came about. Um, and to my li li right, uh, sorry, to your right and my left, um, David Nee, and I won't waste more of our valuable time. Um, Oh, oh, actually, is there somebody who wasn't here before? Because I thought you were presented already, so I think I don't need to present you twice, so we've got one more minute uh, to talk about content. We will proceed as follows. Um, and you know, I need a stop because... Ah, my, my watch stopped yesterday, so I don't have a watch, and I'm just... I'm just see that there is no watch. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you. I should have taken care of this before. Thank you. Um, so now, here we are again. Um, we will proceed as follows. I will ask a similar question um, to all panelists. This gives us the opportunity to compare the different countries we are talking about and, and different cases, and then we will engage in a discussion here on the panel, and then you've got the opportunity to ask your questions, make, make comments from the audience. So ladies first, I start at my right with Uso. So from um, 
a Nigerian perspective, what type of investment is needed to achieve sustainable development in Nigeria? Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I think the most significant thing to say would be that the investment has to be what is needed for growth. And it has to be the type of investment that creates jobs. So um, we listened to Nancy's presentation in the morning, where she talked about all the PIDA um, investments from the multilaterals and how it's going to do large infrastructure for, for growth. But what happens is that the large infrastructure leaves out the communities. It leaves out the huge populations. It only connects the areas that are of interest to those who are investing in it. So what then happens is that you come to a country like Nigeria, and you find that you don't have interconnecting roads for farmers to take their produce to the markets. And because of this, we lose more than 40% of products uh, annually. And this has happened for a number of years, and it's getting worse. Because also, in the rural areas where the farms are, there is no power. 93 million people, let me just give you some numbers, 93 million people do not have access to power at all. So if you produce um, crops and you're unable to preserve them, you're going to lose them. You're unable to access the market, even a local market, you're going to lose them. The direct impact, of course, is that we have very high inflation because of the cost of uh, consumer products going up. Staple foods that used to be foods for the very poor are no longer affordable. In fact, now, a uh, recent survey we did, families come together to buy um, a bushel of gari, which is a staple. This was something that they could do easier before. So sustainability is about understanding what the needs are and addressing those needs. So if I backtrack, um, looking at the low carbon growth, low carbon growth is the Paris Agreement. And our interpretation of it is that in Nigeria, we have many options. We have a lot of coal, and we have a lot of pressure from the Chinese to develop coal. Very enticing, mouth-watering contracts to do that. But we haven't done it. We have gas, we have oil, we also have renewables. So we have wind, we have biomass, we have you know, hydro. We can do a lot of things from the perspective of power. But it's not happening yet. So what we've done um, over the years was to develop the enabling platforms. Because to do all these things, initially, investors want to see um, a, a framework, a regulatory framework, that enables them to know how to invest. And to know that there is government support for that investment. Now we've pounded the government, we've made them to come up with these enabling policies so that we can begin to support our agriculture and agribusiness properly with the infrastructure that they need. So now we do have appropriate enabling platforms to drive that sort of growth. And so we want investment, small infrastructure for agro-processing, for storage, for cold chains, for ICT, so that a youth, a young person in a rural area can trade. He can say, my grandmother has 500, um, 500 bushels of, of maize. And he communicates that on an online export house. And that kind of trading can begin to happen. The, we are fortunate in Nigeria in the sense that we do have the natural resources. We have the human resource, we have agriculture is labor intensive, the way we do it. But we're not complaining, we have the labor. And that labor is what will drive social inclusion. It, will, it is what will drive us to be able to create jobs that we need to create in order to, to grow. I don't know whether you know that the World Bank recently said that Nigeria requires about 40 million jobs by 2030. That is the kind of goal that we're looking for, and that's not a funny task. But it is possible. Because we're not talking about jobs that are just direct jobs from employment. We're talking about social entrepreneurships, 
We're talking about small and medium scale enterprises. We're talking about the ability to empower them, to enable them to set up their own businesses. So once the, once the investment environment is clear and that, okay, here you can do uh, storage, here you can do agro processing, here you can do cold chains, they go off, access some small loans, and drive those businesses themselves. Now, what I'm talking about now is already happening. The problem is to take it to scale. We have a number of you know, activities ongoing, but unable to assess the kind of finance we need to take it to scale and make it uh, something that is nationwide. We only have pockets of pilots here and there that have been supported by international development agencies so far to, to come to, to life. But going to scale, taking that further now to make growth really realistic to, to people is where we are, and that is the challenge that we face. And it is not a small challenge, especially when you look at um, all the issues we're talking about today. There are conflicts of interest. There's EPA countering what we're trying to do with growing agro-processing. So maybe I'll stop here for now. Just have one um, small uh, question, because when listening to you, maybe besides not with, rega with regard to the to coal, coal issues, but yeah. The other issues you raised, uh, would you say this is very specific to Nigeria? So what is the Nigerian, um, um, let's say, focus here? Because looking at the different plans we, we talked about this morning and, and different initiatives, probably one, one could say similar things uh, for other African countries. So is there something you would say this is really special about Nigeria? Everything I've told is about Nigerian experience. But what you have to understand about Africa, especially in West Africa, is that the, the natural resource is similar. I mean, agriculture is something that can support economic diversification in most African countries. Nigeria has always had a mono economy. We've been trying to move away from that by improving our food security. So agri agriculture and agribusiness is the next step to take in order to make that happen. And it's, it's the same of many African countries. The infrastructure deficit is common to African countries. It's just that the way that it will be addressed and how you bring it to the table could differ. But the fundamental problems are the same. How we would tackle it in Nigeria, given our size and given the, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of our, of our young ones and you know, our, everybody generally, might be different from the way another person will, will tackle it in, a, in another part of Africa. But fundamentally, the challenges are the same. And that is why you know, something like the EPA looks the same. It, cut, it cuts across. The EPA for the ECOWAS is cutting across 16 countries. And it's the same, same language. However, there are individual differences in the countries that make it difficult for Nigeria, for example, to sign it the way it is. So the experiences I'm talking about in terms of um, small infrastructure to address the majority of people is typical to Nigeria and many other countries that have the same kind of demographic distribution. Yeah, thank you. Hunzi, with regard to South Africa, um, South Africa is maybe a bit a different case because um, uh, not as many people are poor, but still there are uh, problems relating to sustainable development, be it um, um, <coughs> environment policies, be it um, poverty in some poverty pockets, limited um, spaces. So what, what would you say, um, what do you need, what kind of investments does South Africa need? Um, thank you, Julia. I think, I think let's start with a misconception here. Let's just clean up the disagreements first. South Africa has a huge problem with poverty. <laughs> Let's start there. So I, took a I took a comparative perspective. No, 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 I mean, no. if you take let a comparative me, let me put it perspective... To you let me put it to you this way. Comparatively, on the face of it, it can be very misleading. Okay? Because South Africa has, for instance, a stock exchange that is amongst the top 20 in the world in terms of the way it's run. Mm? So when you look at that, you think, wow. Yeah? It has the best auditing field in terms of the profession. We have we're the best auditors in the world. So you think, wow, okay? We used to have the best infrastructure. 
actually. We're probably in the top five at some stage, but we're going down very fast. Yeah? But when you look at job creation and unemployment, South Africa sits at a staggering, there's no agreement on this, between 26 percent being the official figure and maybe 35 to 40 percent being a figure that people disagree about. Mm? It's amongst the largest in the world. When we hit the financial crisis, the global financial crisis, South Africa was also the first country in the world that can make this claim because I was at the International Labour Organization in 2008-2009 that responded to the global financial crisis, responded by putting together a presidential joint task force. We bragged about it at, at, at Fora to say, we are on the ball, we're watching this. However, because South Africa also is one of the most, one of the countries that executes the least, yeah? if, 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 if talking was a way of growing the economy, South Africa would be, <laughs> we would be leaders, yeah? But because we execute the least, we lost the highest number of jobs only compared to Spain in the world. Hmm? We also are, at some stage, people disagree whether we are amongst the leaders or we lead in terms of the Gini coefficient uh, inequality. Okay, you've got the very wealthy and the very poor. So I wanted to start. So what there. are the policies that will ah, change this? Okay. So, so the, the, the thing for South Africa is that, uh, and maybe I want to go back a little bit and just say, you know, <clears throat> I was very concerned about the discussion we had l last night was a very thought-provoking discussion. The discussion we had just before lunch was a very thought-provoking discussion. And there's a word, I think, that Carlos used yesterday, and I think he talked about infantilization, mm. eh? creating people like babies, eh? to treat us like kids. I think for me, I want to start there and say, as long as there's an attempt by anybody outside Africa to treat Africa in a patronistic and in an infantilistic manner, these are never going to succeed, okay? So when we talk about things and we say we're going to create an environment and we're doing with, for, about, I don't know, all these words we use, we've got to be very careful. So I want to start there because it's very important. What South Africa needs and what Africa needs is sustained, unimposed, impactful investment that empowers. Hmm? Empowers the people on the ground, empowers the communities, empowers and takes away poverty. Deals directly with the 2030 SDG issues. Deals directly with the 2063 cross-reference issues. Yeah? So we need that. So South Africa. South Africa has a very interesting situation where we've led for many years in policy uh, drafting and policy execution, uh, no, no, policy uh, passing of, of policies and coming up with regulations and so on. But again, we fail with execution. Remember, I said we execute the list. And a lot of our colleagues in the continent, there was a time when they just followed what South Africa does. I mean, I know for a long time, Kenya, uh, we, we used to be very upset, just followed. And when we're looking for Kenya to support us, uh, Kenya would say, no, 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 we like this law. We're going to pass it. Um, and, and of course, Kenya would clean it up and do it a little bit differently and better. But, but we, we have very rigid, incoherent policies. And we fail to do what I would call a RIA, your regulatory impact assessments. We simply just fail in executing because our inspectorate maybe doesn't do a good job in checking for issues or relating to OSH or whatever the situation may be. And then we pass another law to police the last law. Yeah? So, so, so you, you have a, a, an amalgamation of laws looking at each other, but nobody quite implements them. So as a result, you have a country that has huge potential. And I think that's the other thing you're referring to. It, it has, a, it has a, a historical situation that gives it huge potential, but which is being eroded because we are not implementing as we go along. But what do we need? So typically to what uh, Ozu was saying, we, we really have similar issues. South Africa has an abundance of land. Africa has an abundance of land. South Africa is the same. Africa is an abundance of what lies below the land, the beautiful stuff that you guys came and took away from us, and then you don't leave us with any value-added stuff. Now, we have all of that, but we've come to realize that for us to have balanced economies, we need to do more. So when you talk about issues relating to technology, 
we do need technological investment. Um, we do need to keep up with the future of work. When we talk about the Africa we want in terms of the 2063 agenda, we've also got to look at the future we want and the future work opportunities that we want so that we can, comp we can continue to, to grow and diversify. We have a lot of requirements in terms of agriculture um, as well. So your agro-related situations and your food security-related situations are also key. In the construction environment, we also need a lot of investment, but maybe I should explain that because we've got a lot of good construction companies that, for instance, were able to build all the stadia that we have in South Africa, some of which are white elephants now that came with the uh, 2010 uh, Football World Cup. Uh, now we don't know what to do with them. They're standing there, they're looking pretty, but they ain't, they ain't being used. So we have a lot of companies that do that, but what we don't have is enough funding and some kind of assistance to be able to have accommodation, for instance, in the educational environment. You know, you, you mentioned that I'm, I'm a chairman of one of the universities. So my university typically has about 22,000 students. But out of the 22,000 students, we can only cater for 3,000 students in terms of beds. So about 19,000 have to find a place to live somewhere uh, in squalor sometimes, and it creates a lot of the uh, protests you see in South Africa. You know, you've had things about hashtag fees must fall. You've had issues relating to people not having places to sleep and whatever. So you have a situation where people leave. I mean, uh, my university is sort of one of the top seven in the African continent and the top five in South Africa. So people travel to go to the university, many, many kilometers, a thousand kilometers, and then you have no family, you have no money, you've got nowhere to go. So we need investments in that area to create accommodation, to create um, some kind of a very sustainable living environment for, for our students. I think I'll stop there for now and then I'll come back later. Yeah. Thank you. Um, David, for you, the same question from a Kenyan perspective, and you already gave some examples in your last um, last presentation, what type of investments, what is needed for sustainable development in Kenya? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I, 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 I'm glad I like this panel because uh, I, I'm able to take a different tack from the previous high-level conversation and actually compliment what they're saying because it resonates with me and it, it resonates a lot in Kenya as well. So we do have a lot of, of, of similarities, but it's, but it's important to demonstrate the nuances which makes people understand why you need to look at every country uh, in its own case. Now, if you ask me as an economist uh, what, what investments you need to do, and uh, I then go quickly back to my economic theory, and I say that uh, the sort of what the purpose of investment, how investment connects with development, is a variable we call capital power worker. If you look at all economic models, when they talk about capital, they all, it's always capital per worker. Okay? So what that tells you is the purpose of capital is to equip your workforce. So when I ask myself about investment, I quickly move from there and the macro and the big conversations and ask myself, what, which worker am I equipping? This capital, this investment, which job is it creating? Yeah? So if I cannot connect that investment with a worker, uh, whether directly or indirectly, uh, that is where, if you ask in Kenya, they will tell you I disagree with practically everybody, because they are not able to get that concept. If you cannot track for me an investment to a job, then economically, it doesn't make sense. It, that's the stuff which gets lost in the middle. Yeah? And I, I also ask, what is the cost of creating this job? So if I may polarize, uh, if you do a steel plant, you're going to create jobs, for high-end jobs, at the cost of $10,000 per job, probably more. In fact, probably $50,000 per job. If you do a sweatshop, uh, you're going to create jobs at $1,500 a job. So as an economist, I say, what's the opportunity cost of a steel mill? 
say, a steel mill which creates 1,000 jobs, the same capital could create 50,000 sweat job, jobs. I'm polarizing because of the sweat shops is a, but, but what I mean is a labor intensive, if, you're, if what you're looking for is labor and creating jobs, then you want labor intensive investment. Mm -hmm. And that's where in Kenya we have a huge political economy conflict between our elite, our political elite. Because our political elite are the owners of capital. They're the ones who inherited the capital. What's going on in South Africa now? I watched South Africa and I laughed. Said they are doing this thing called uh, the Af what do you call the, the the Africanization thing after what was it called? The B. B. Black economy of power. Said ah, I know that one. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> it was called Africanization. The African elite acquired all the assets. Then they became stakeholders in the status quo. And that one always reads you to the one direction, where there is a bias towards capital intensive investments, which increase profits. And it also leads you to the direction of conflict of interest between elites in the public sector, strategizing public sector and business. And that leads you to the root of corruption. And that's exactly where South Africa has gone. And we kept saying, no African learned from the mistakes of others. South Africans are going to do exactly what we did. Zimbabweans did it. <laughs> so we're watching South Africans do it. Uh, and that's whatever. So that's the capital you need is the capital which equips your workers. So you've got to look at what's the character of your labor force. Now, the character of the Kenyan labor force, unlike the South African labor force or Zambian labor force, uh, which have got a huge resource-based economy and very urbanized, Kenya is what we call an entrepreneurial economy. It has more self-employed people than employed people. Yeah? We have a labor force now, a working labor force of about 16 million people. Uh, about 10 million of them work in non-farm, micro and small enterprises, uh, of who about three quarters is their own small businesses. Okay? Another four million work on their own little farms. So they are smallholder farmers. Again, they are self-employed. So that leaves you only about three million people working in the what you call, I call the corporatized economy. Two million in the proper private sector, the kind of businesses he runs, and 1.2 million in public sector. So, when, but when you listen to conversations around employment, people are talking about payroll jobs, yeah? bringing investment to create more payroll jobs. And I tell them, in Kenya, that's a complete waste of time, uh, because we actually have very low unemployment. Because one of the characteristics of this self-employment economy is that it has very low unemployment because the entry barriers are very low. You know, you don't need to apply to jobs to a big company. You finish school and uh, you join your cousin's garage, you know, as an apprentice and you sort of hang around there, learn a bit of welding, and the next thing you are sort of a uh, sort of, uh, cowboy contractor uh, doing all sorts of uh, things. That's the way the Kenyan economy works. Uh, in fact, then people say, but no, this is, these are inferior jobs. And people actually should, then we should corporatize. That's what the elite will say. We should corporatize so that people get former white collar sort of payroll jobs. But this, it's also once a culture it develops, partly it reflects people's preferences. Because in Kenya, we call people who work in corporate enterprises, we call them Thai people. And it's a bit not very complimentary. <laughs> being, being to a Thai is not a complimentary thing. In fact, in my language, we distinguish between work and job. They're not the same name. Work is what you do for yourself. And the name for a job in my language loosely translates to bondage. So what people want to do is stay in bondage for as little as possible, get a little capital and skills, and go out and actually work for themselves. That's not about to change. 
incident. People say it will change, it's transitional. It isn't. So what you see is a micro small enterprise economy, which is very dynamic, by the way. If you look at incomes, there's no difference between people. If you analyze them by skill level and that kind of thing, they earn the same incomes. So the labor market works. It, it arbitrages between the, the different types of jobs. What a university graduate of five years experience would earn uh, in the bank is about the same they will make if they are running their own little money shop where they do M-Pesa and all those other things that we, we like to do. Now, what does that say about what kind of investment you need? The investment you need in a place like that, like Kenya, is not investment which creates new jobs, is investment which raises the productivity of existing jobs. Because everybody is working. The problem is that the more of them join the labor force and there is no investment, then capital power falls. Yeah? When we have a recession in Kenya, it is not that people lose jobs. What happens is that everybody's income falls because there is less work for everybody. So you don't have a situation where some people are working and earning a good salary, and others have been made redundant and are not earning. What you have is if we are running a garage, if we are running a garage or a furniture workshop as a big group, uh, which some are employed, some are doing their own things, is a complicated arrangement that people have. They are sort of like cooperative enterprises or whatever. What will happen is that there is less work coming. So we are working less hours, and therefore we are taking home less money. But it is a more resilient system uh, than you have in a corporate economy where there is a recession and people are, are sort of sent packing. So once you understand that structure of economy, uh, then you align your investment to that kind of economy. I will end up with one example, simple one, a case study of sustainable ecological sure. type thing. Yeah. Now. One of our most successful enterpri corporate enterprises in Kenya is called the KTDA, Kenya Tea Development Agency. This is an agricultural collective which supports our about half a million smallholder tea farmers and is the single largest exporter of black tea in the world, about $2 billion worth of black tea. It has 65 processing plants, factories, the biggest manufacturer in the various tea growing places. Now, because tea is grown in mountainous places in the highlands with hills and, and lots of little streams. What the KTDA decided to do a couple of years ago is say, we have all these little rivers where we grow tea, and we are buying a lot of power from our utility, and we are cutting a lot of trees to, to cure the tea. So they decided that, that they were going to do mini hydropower plants on those little rivers. And the last time I was talking to KTDA, they said that two years ago, they've done about 15 of them. They need to do, they're planning to do another five. And in a couple of years, KTDA will be doing all its tea value chain on clean power from its mini hydros. I think they are go, they've done about 20 megawatts. They want to do about 40 megawatts. Now, how have they, that's the kind of capital you need. Even if you're talking about corporate level capital, the key to sustainable, uh, because you look at this organization, you say, why isn't it doing the sort of things that big, a private sector entities coming from wherever are doing. The reason why it's not doing those things and it's doing this is not because it wants to save the planet. <laughs> uh, it, belongs, it belongs to the people. And they live in that environment. And they value that environment because if you go where we grow tea, it's very sort of pristine, clean, uh, sort of places, and they don't want to destroy the environment. So when you come up with a proposal that we can actually uh, produce, become even more sustainable, they, they're very quick to go for it. They put in their own capital. Of course, they've borrowed some money and raised resources from other places. I just want to give an illustration. How, how your economy is owned itself is very important because, I, especially like in a country like Kenya where most of us are still an agrarian society, uh, our alignment, our, the, the, the goals of sustain, uh, ecological sustainability resonate very strongly with people. I have no doubt that when people are empowered and they own their more economy, they will do sustainable things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you're basically saying that Ivanka Trump in the US has a job, right? So, no, no, no. Not work. <laughs> she doesn't do the work. <laughs>
<laughs> if it's if it's the thing to to bondage, yeah. But well, actually, yeah, I, I thank you very much for these different illustrations of 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 different uh, country contexts. I think there's one uh, common thread that that all of you emphasize, and that's uh, the jobs, and that's something that you find in all narratives, in all plans. So I'd like to um, push you a bit further because if we imagine um, that we now have more jobs or African people have more jobs, then still the question is, if you as an individual earn money and you can maintain yourself, who builds the school you are going to? Who takes care that the, the, the uh, water clean investments are made for the environment and not for your own income only? So the next step would be, in order to have sustainable development and, and public goods, I mean, jobs are not an, I mean, we can discuss whether it will, whether the Af African governments will be able and, and markets will be able to create 30 million jobs per year until 2050. That's what what would be needed, basically, given the population growth. But for me, the more interesting question is really: if if jobs are there, how do they lead uh, to more public public goods? You say. Thank you, uh, Julia. What we're talking about is uh, a situation where we, we are stuck. The economy is, has shrunk. And we have a population that we must cater for. So such plans are short to medium term, medium to long term. And in the short to medium term, you have to create jobs. People have to be able to live. No doubt. But then we are also talking about building out new economic zones, new industrial hubs, and then getting the government. The government also has a role in all this. I mean, the, the um, social inclusion expenditures from the government is about infrastructure, it's about education, it's about health, it's about nutrition. But the, in the immediate, to tackle the, the crisis, we do have a crisis of unemployment among our young ones is to stimulate rapidly things that would create jobs in the short term. And then by the medium term, you begin to stabilize and have enough, because all these jobs you're creating, don't forget, would also create revenues for the government it, through you know, taxes and all that. Mm -hmm. And the government begins to get a little bit more money to do other things, especially to put in the infrastructure, the roads, the water, and other things that people need going forward. So it's not, what, we're what I'm trying to portray is that where we are today is a crisis. And if you're in a crisis, you have to solve the immediate, stabilize, and then begin to plan longer term. What big infrastructure does is you know, long term, is medium to long term. All the PPPs, blended finance type of projects take four, five, six years. What do we do till then? And the big infrastructure will not, it will not impact people as much as the small one would. So if you come to a cluster of maybe uh, farmers that grow tomatoes, let me give tomatoes as, as an example, because a lot of work has gone into that in terms of mapping where tomatoes can grow. We spend a lot of money importing tomato paste, but we can produce tomatoes, lots of it. And what happens is that because we don't have the infrastructure, the processing power, we lose it. So what happens? The local manufacturers who make the paste import the triple concentrate, the raw material for it. And that has impoverished our own farmers. So what is happening is that we're importing to save markets in the West while our own farmers are unable to scale. But if you then put infrastructure to support small farmers, it will begin to grow a cluster of an economic activity that impacts other things. You know, it will bring in uh, agro-processing. It will bring in storage. It will bring in cold chains. It will bring in all kinds of things that you can't even think about now that will grow from there. This is a short-term thing that will happen for maize, for sorghum, for rice. These are crops that we have the capacity for self-sufficiency. To, in, in two years. That's what our, plan, our economic plan says. We can do it in two years. 
but we must invest correctly. We have to put in power for irrigation. For example, in rice, flood the rice uh, farms and deflood the rice farms with powered uh, pumps so that you get the, the maximum crop yield. In that way, instead of importing 10 million tons of rice, we begin to produce it. And already, changing the way that we are planting now is showing that we have some, some traction in that area. What we need to do is to scale it. But as we scale it, and as we, as we get more income from taxes, that's the government, the government then has to put money into those other areas for bigger infrastructure, for health and education, for nutrition. That is the government's responsibility. But the private sector is the one that can drive this small scale, rapid uh, infrastructure for rapid growth. Yeah, thank you. Um, Tunsi, um, we just heard that the state plays a role, right? So, and you just ri rightly said that uh, South Africa is one of the states where uh, social inequality is highest on a, on a world scale. So it's really compared to other world regions and not, not, not only with, within uh, Africa. So my question would be, and again, compared to other African countries, South African income is still very high. Taxation is, compared to other African case, uh, countries, not too bad. Nevertheless, you've got that, that huge social um, inequality. Um, why? And how can investments and growth be used? And what, what, does the, what role does the state play? And maybe taxation as well. And you might want to draw um, on your experience from, the, from uh, your role in the B20 to tell us a bit about this, because the G20 is a lot about taxation as well. Hmm. Okay, that's a very broad question. So let me start maybe, because I do want to share some of the B20 recommendations, but I'll look for the o an opportune time to, to do it, um, uh, because it's, it's very important as part of this discussion. But where we are failing, I touched on a little bit, uh, is in terms of implementation. Um, we have very good policies, very sound policies. Um, we, were one, we were the first member of the ILO in 1919 when it gets to standards. You know, we lead when, even when we were having something to do with domestic workers as in terms of a, uh, you know, a convention in the ILO, we were leading, we'd already done it. You know? So we've done all of these things. But uh, somewhere, if you give us a World Cup, we've proved to be the best event managers in the world. If you give us a cricket anything or a soccer anything, we'll deliver it for you. But somebody's got to tell us from outside with rules from outside, and we must just tick the box, and then somehow we perform. So we're a bit of a conundrum uh, in, in South Africa in terms of uh, our failure. I, I believe that part of our failure is, is leadership. Uh, we have a... Um, a situation where having an inherited a South Africa that was bankrupt financially, um, and not many people knew this, um, we started well, but I think that we needed some kind of therapy, perhaps, for the oppressive behavior that we had in the past so that we could be able to deal with our issues and be able to manage things a little bit better. Maybe, I'm not it's sure. It's a social issue. It's a yes. social issue. I think, I think it's, it's how we manage and how we process things and how we execute things, um, you know, in, instead of being the, the, the people who leverage the freedom, we tend to have oppressive ways of doing things the same way it was done to us by the oppressor, you know, like a, in, a, in an abusive home kind of situation, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's part of this. Um, if you look also at our youth, um, we have a, a very huge unemployed youth, about the numbers I was quoting, about 70% of that is young people and about 70% of that is women, yeah? Um, now, David said an interesting thing about an entrepreneurial culture. Now, South Africa has had a mixed kind of culture between corporate and entrepreneurial, but there's been an erosion of the entrepreneurial culture over the years. Um, some of us started asking a long time ago and saying, why is it that we send our kids to very expensive schools? Because, you know, that's the other thing. We've got huge private schooling in South Africa. But we are teaching them to look for jobs, not to create jobs. So it's, a, it's an attitudinal kind of situation where 
you're telling them they must find jobs. Uh, and most of the guys, particularly when we're doing this black economic empowerment, some of our white counterparts would say they have to leave the country because they can't find a job. But they were never saying, I'm going to create a job. So that's probably another situation here. And, and you've had a, um, a, a challenge in that in trying to get this new order, this new way of doing things, um, we've taken our foot off public education as well. So you have a huge emphasis on private education. So the leadership of the country, from the president right down to the very bulky ministerial cabinet that we have, um, their kids do not go to public schools. Now, that's the one thing that the previous people who ran South Africa pre-'94 did very well. They made their public schools very strong. They made the artisanal schools very strong for, teach, for, for, for the education of artisans. When we got uh, away, we, we got rid of apartheid, we threw the baby out with the bathwater, we threw out the apprenticeship schools, something that Germany is very strong in. We threw away all the vocational training stuff, which we now realize we need, we don't have it. And we're trying to reintroduce it via the TVET uh, schools and, and via the, 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 uh, the vocational education training uh, environments. So from an educational point of view, I think we took the wrong path. Mm. Um, and in terms of, Productivity, okay. That was it's very subdued applause. <laughs> Should have been <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of productivity as well. Just to touch on that very quickly, quickly um, please. Very quickly, mm. um, you'll find that we have a huge emphasis on wages in South Africa. We've just done the minimum mm. wage. Now we lead with that too. The ILO is going to be very proud of us, but I don't know how we're going to deliver on it. Um, we we but we do wages without tracking wages for productivity. You cannot mm. do that. So, yeah. OK, thanks. So one last question, and then we open um, for the audience. So I'll um, rephrase the question a bit and like to focus on taxation, because there is a large number of people in um, Kenya living still in poverty and, and absolute poverty. So my question would be, why doesn't the Kenyan state um, succeed to transfer um, income and resources uh, to its people? Actually, we have a very strong tax base. We collect 20% of GDP, which is uh, about as high as you can with the, the size of economy we have and its structure. And if you look at which are the, how you're able to do that with a micro enterprise economy, is because what we had to do, because, because you can't charge a lot of payroll taxes, you don't have uh, a lot of people on payroll, we rely a lot on indirect taxes. So our single largest tax is VAT. You know, fairly developed, it's taken time to develop a fairly elaborate VAT system so that you can actually capture people consumption, which is a logical thing to do. You want to tax consumption as opposed to incomes if you can. Uh, we are actually able to finance quite a lot of public goods. Uh, with it, we uh, we finance. I mean, if you look at the sort of our demographic and the youth bulge, for instance, if you look at the single largest budget item in Kenya is education. Yeah, all the way. Education is free all the way to uh, a primary school. Primary school is free. We have this bad habit we acquired from British called boarding schools. So those ones are not free, but in secondary schools. Uh, which people don't go board are free. Uh, university is highly subsidized. But given the number of people coming through the system, as you were saying, we have this youth bulge. It, it's quite charged. But we do finance. We are not an independent economy. Let me, let me say that. Aid is less than 3% of our budget. We can actually do without it. There are years, except now that this government has begun to do huge infrastructure. In the previous 10 years, our goal was to actually exit sort of aid, graduate from aid. And we can, yeah, it would take us two or three years to do it. Um, if you look at infrastructure, for instance, you're talking about roads, and here that's somebody saying, how why are African countries not able to do that? We finance all our road maintenance from a dedicated tax on petrol. Yeah, uh, it's called fuel levy. Every time you, you, you fuel your car, ha almost one third of the price of fuel in Kenya is a tax. And it, it's a ring fan tax. It goes to something called a road levy, road, road fund. It raises, I think we are now about $3 billion a year. 
And that's what we use to finance. We do not use borrow money from get money from our, uh, outsiders to finance maintenance. We may borrow for to build the roads, but we don't borrow for maintenance. So we do have a fairly strong. Uh, why are we uh, then? Why do we have such a high incidence of poverty? It's a political economy question, which is I referred to. That if you look at the elite in power, which is where South Africa has gone, the people in government straddle government and business. Because they straddle government and business, they put capital where it will make their businesses more efficient and profitable. They don't put their capital where it will make labor more productive. Yeah? That's, and it's the same South Africa thing. They went in, the big guys like Ramaphosa and others acquired the mines and the Coca Cola franchises and all sorts of things. Okay, saying <laughs> <laughs> the, the question of income distribution, yeah. the question of income distribution is a political economy question. In, don't repeat everything you say. Yeah, so in every country, how income is distributed depends on who has captured the people who make the policy decisions. So if you go to the US, it's big business, the military industrial types, the all sorts of people. So even in our countries, we do have a political economy. You need to understand who are the owners of capital and how are they driving their interest. And that's part of the thing that uh, you need to, that's the political contest. That's the political contest that, uh, that, that we actually have. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I think we got many insights in three different context, so I'd now like to open the floor and I take uh, three <coughs> questions, comments, and I see two in my front. Go ahead. Um, do we have a micro? Yeah. So here it is. Um. Yeah? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Uzo, I think you, you brought the answer to the question, what kind of uh, investment do we, do we need in Africa? Because what I heard from you, I want to be sure that I heard well, is that we need some kind of differentiation of the level of investment that we, we, we should implement, starting from very quickly dealing with the issues that we have at the, at the basic level, in such a way that when we bring intermediate investment, we can now speed up the, the yield and get to another stage where we then really trigger growth. That's what I understood from you. And putting together what my other two brothers said, we understand well the kind of investment that we need. But now, I want to bring this back looking at the previous conversations since yesterday and looking for the stakes here. I'm referring to the compact and the, and the Marshall Plan. I want to connect what you are saying to those for us to learn a lesson because I was sitting here taking notes and really learning a lesson. How, how, how are we then going to succeed? How much regulation do you think will be needed to make those plans effective, considering what you just said, and also considering what Tunzi said about not implementing the regulations and the laws that we have, because my country is like yours. We have very good laws, but implementation is always a problem. Even my neighbors, Uzo didn't say it, but I, but I know that we have crucial issues in implementing. So how much reg regulation do you think we will need for that? And how are, we manage, how are we going to manage this time on to get that implemented? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just behind you. Mm -hmm. And please uh, introduce yourself. Salim Samai, I have two questions. First question, although Mr. D mentioned it, my question is, is education free? in South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya. My second question is, 
in view of the Western African relationship, why is Mugabe the bad guy? That was a question for Tumsi, or what? <laughs> okay, I stop. So we take a, a third um, question, comment if there's one. If not, we just, oh, well, there's one here at my left. So Afalabi Mokode is my name. I'm a delegate from Nigeria, and I actually represent the government. Um, I think mine is a comment, not necessarily a question, and just to support um, what Uzo and um, all the other speakers have said. I think clearly, and um, I do agree with Mr. Ndi uh, from Kenya, uh, the issue really is targeting your investment uh, towards job creation. And what we did in Nigeria, uh, which I know Uzo has also alluded to in a lot of our, our presentations, is really being able to dimension. Uh, there is the bottom up and there is the top down. Now, what, what we've done, especially even with the government's um, own uh, funding now of social jobs, is really to attack it from the bottom up, but then tying it, tying the outputs of that even to the economic uh, sector uh, position. Another thing that uh, uh, which uh, Uzo was speaking to is the fact that we also need to be able to, and which helps with what Mr. Indy was saying be able to dimension job creation on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, uh, wherein you're able to then look at labor-intensive jobs versus, uh, you, you know, whether you call it profiteering, you know, kind of jobs that, you know, when you bring in a lot of investment. Because what you find with automation and, and technology many times, you know, heavy investment, but then a uh, little number of jobs created to be able to mop up your high rate of unemployment. So when you look at that and juxtapose it by the fact that you must get a lot of people employed, you then have to go to certain sectors that can really give you productivity. Agriculture, definitely one. Mining, uh, which is also a priority for us, is another. Renewable energy is another, which can power a lot of all the sectors, agriculture and whatever you, construction. Um, is another I like to describe Nigeria as a, uh, as a construction site. Um, so I think that's really how we've got to look at this in terms of investment and, uh, and job creation. And when you then begin to speak about investment, you, you need to target your investment sometimes at the, very, at, at the start to give you what can give you incremental uh, you know, uh, job creation efforts, while, you know, uh, almost like an emergency uh, measure, and then um, as you ramp up to then get higher investment for mid-term, long-term uh, objectives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So this was, was rather common. So we've got um, three uh, questions on the table, and I'd like um, we have a second round. Um, the first one was with regard to linking up to the, the different, different plans and initiatives. So since it was addressed directly to you, and maybe in Tumsi you want to come in, because since it links to the plans, it links to G20 and then maybe to B20 as well. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, what I picked from the compact and the Marshall Plan is a kind of new direction to... Um, involve the private sector in growth. So I, going back, the challenge we have in Africa, especially in Nigeria, is that the government is expected to create jobs. But it is the private sector that creates jobs. The government enables the policies that create jobs. So from these new approaches from Compact and Marshall Plan, it appears as if that point of correction, that's my interpretation, that point of correction has been taken, and that this time around, um, these interventions will focus more on the private sector. If the private sector begins to drive job creation, you will see a rapid um, improvement in the rollout of jobs, not just direct jobs like employment, but also the jobs that uh, David alluded to and uh, Mumtuzi alluded to, jobs that are entrepreneurial. The African environment is full of entrepreneurship. We have evolved that way as a result of the way our countries have evolved, where the government is, seems to be in charge of job creation. And when there's a gap, 
people do what they have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. So that's how come we have so much entrepreneurial spirit. And if you put in the enabling infrastructure, people will do what they have to do to survive. That is just how we have evolved. And so I think that what we are doing in Nigeria is to leverage on what we see. So the minister has explained that Compact Africa is something that is voluntary. So you, you present yourself, what, how you intend to access it, what your plans are, and negotiate. Mm. And that, that's what we want to begin to do. We want to begin to do transactions. And to make that happen, the enabling policies, the regulatory frameworks are important. So you're saying, what kind of you know, regulatory frameworks? Something like renewable power is the driver for us in, in Nigeria, because it had been almost not in the energy mix. So we've been able to scale that to about 36% of the energy mix, which means that if you drive it accurately and aggressively, we are going to create a lot of jobs and also trigger growth in agribusiness and agro-processing and all those kind of businesses, small businesses, large in, in labor intensive, create a number of social jobs that we need. So th that's the linkage. And we have s numerous regulations in that area that we've done in the last two years to get ourselves prepared to receive the appropriate investments. So we hope that if we present you know, packages for investment from the private sector, that it will receive you know, the kind of interest that we want it to receive if the compact is what it says it is. Thank you. There was this other question of free education, whether there is free education in all, because I think Tunzi Yes, in Nigeria, there is an it. element of free education, um, and those schools are not doing well. So the, pu the pub public schools, as you would call them, are free, basically. But they're very poor in terms of, the, in terms of their content, curriculum content, because the government is unable to fund them uh, adequately. So most people get to go to private schools. The universities are free, basically. But then what has happened is that many Nigerians go to Ghana, to school in Ghana and other countries, because the quality has dropped. So that's the impact of the so-called free that we really can't afford at the moment, unless the government puts in more funding into education. But that money is not available at the moment. Uh, I think that was yeah, that that were the question. So maybe in Tunzi, with regard to the blends there's and the relationship. There's no free the education blends. in South Africa. Mm. Um, we've got public education, which is cheaper than the private. At university, it's heavily subsidized, um, and poor students who qualify up to about uh, 500,000 rands, which translates to how many dollars? I can't remember now. About 30,000 dollars, probably um, mm. per annum, qualify for funding from from the state. Um, completely, you know, tuition and accommodation. Um, then, why is Mugabe a bad guy? I, I, you know, Zimbabwe is right next door to South Africa, so I, I don't want to say things like this. I don't. You, I think the economy of Zimbabwe uh, has failed. So, as a result, you know, a lot of Zimbabweans work in South Africa. I think you may be aware we've got a, a lot and lots of, of Zimbabweans in South Africa. Uh, as to why he's a bad guy, I don't know. I think I'll leave that to the political world. Uh, <laughs> uh, where, from a B20 point of view, I just want to mention. Because Sorry, maybe you could just shortly say what B20 is, because oh. not everybody might be aware. So, so B20 stands for Business 20. So you've got the G20 countries, and South Africa happens to be one of the 20. So we have a Business 20 that works very closely with the G20. And lately, we also have the L20 that works very closely. Then there's other 20s that I'm not going to get into, the Think 20 and the Youth 20 and so on. But the B and the L are always uh, going from when it started under Nicolas Sarkozy in France, and then it moved every year. The chairmanship changes. And then when you have the president of the country being the head of the G, you then have the president of business being the head of the B20. So that's basically, now it's under Germany, so we've got uh, the chairmanship of the B20 is here in Germany, then it moves to Argentina. Now every year, um, we come up with things that we suggest to government, and what we've realized over the years is that 
there's a problem again with implementation, uh, Martin. So the governments undertake and sign things every year. We work hard and put documents together. We contribute to this. We speak to the different, uh, whether Think 20, Youth 20, whatever 20, and, and we build it into the business 20 proposals that we have, but we have a problem. So this year, which I'm not going to be able to have time because we, we, we're running short of time now, we've given a few um, uh, recommendations, in fact, 10 recommendations to this partnership for Africa, which is why you had me ask the gentleman about how he's going to make it work, because it's curious to me. Um, every country has a prioritization um, and, and a list of things they want to do. Germany prioritized Africa. It therefore does not mean that Argentina will prioritize Africa, even though Argentina says it will continue. I, I, I even spoke to my colleague in business that they will continue. But after that, we don't know. So for me, you need to sell it, therefore, to, to all the G20 players, because then it has a higher chance of it being implemented. What we find is working these days in the G20 is to, we've created some kind of a peer mechanism situation where you actually put the governments on the spot. You actually say, last year when we were here, you undertook to do one, two, three, four, five. Can you please give us an account of what, how many you've covered on the five? And that embarrassment element uh, tends to, we find, works a little bit because they all end up competing. The one says, no, I've done 20 in mine. The one says, oh, you've only done 10 in yours. So it's the only way, unfortunately, it's like kids. Uh, but, but, but we find that it, it works. But just on the, on the very quick, some of the issues we've recommended is quick. we... Okay, quick, no, I'm going to leave it because I'm not going to finish. I speak One. to other people because there's 10 of them. So if I, I might mention three Pick and then the, leave the seven. It's about prioritizing. With Let the, me prioritize. With the, Sherpa, with the Sherpa, you've got three minutes. Let so me prioritize. One. So, okay, we've, we've, we've given recommendations on the strengthening of the environment for foreign direct investment. We've given, in terms of boosting investment infrastructure and enhance, enhancement of investment in the infrastructure by providing better information and infrastructure project details. We've given them something on enabling reliable and affordable energy. Increasing digital connectivity was a very big one. Digitalization in terms of the future of work and how we are able to uh, maximize productivity and create competitive countries and so on is a very, very big part as we're going forward. And then the others are to foster open and inclusive trade and honest trade. The one element that I'm going to take through from Carlos's presentation yesterday and the things we're talking about this morning is I think we need to open up this trade area a little bit more. I'm going to make it my business to do that because I will be in Argentina as well. And uh, the others I will discuss with people offline. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I'm. we had the T20 summit um, yesterday and the day before. And the Sherpa at the end, just to confirm what you said, the Sherpa presented there, the Argent Argentinian Sherpa. And she confirmed that um, Argentina will continue to, to have a priority uh, on Africa and the cooperation with Africa and they also confirmed that they would uh, continue with the compact with, with Africa of the German presidency. But now I learned that David is keen to tell us about something about uh, the Zimbabwean case. I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you said. I was really cu I was really curious about it. But it, he he said it really. I was curious about it. Go ahead. Okay, I was going to say two things. One, one the, the, the relevance of the compacts, and I said I'll make a comment about, <laughs> about oh. Zimbabwe. The comment, I'll make the comment first. Is Mugabe a bad guy? Mugabe is a bad guy because Zimbabwe postponed dealing with the land transfer issue at independence. It was persuaded by Western countries, by the UK, uh, to not to defy this issue. Uh, it came to back to bite them much, much later. Like it will come back to bite South Africa. It's beginning to do it now. Uh, we were lucky we did it early, although we didn't do it. We didn't complete it. We st it's still an, uh, there are some areas where it's still unraveling. If you read the papers, we have a crisis in a place called Laikipia, where people like Koki Galman own uh, hundred thousands of acres of, of land, which they have converted into nature conservancies, uh, which belong to Maasai pastoralists. So those issues are not unresolved. So in Zimbabwe. Mugabe is trying to do what he should have done, what Zimbabwe should have done in 1970, in 1980. Is he a good guy or a bad guy? It all has to be done. And there, I don't think there is a neat way of doing it. So but the reason why there's a lot of ambivalence in Africa about whether Mugabe is a bad guy is because people understand that that land issue has to be dealt with one way or the other. And nobody can actually tell you how to deal with it. Those are some of the fundamentals. Every, I, was saying it, it, I said I would comment because it illustrates that 
Every country is different. You try and talk investment without Zimbabwe without understanding that context, you, you will miss the, the boat completely. You talk about Nigeria. The, diff the big contrast between Nigeria and Kenya is that Nigeria is an oil economy. It's trying to solve the problems of an oil economy. Uh, because oil economy makes governments lazy. They don't develop a revenue base because they rely on oil revenue. It also kills your productive sectors like agriculture in something we call Dutch disease. So that's the problem they are dealing with. We don't have that problem because our government depends on peasant agriculture for its tax base. In Kenya, if you want government to move, what we normally do is organize farmers to protest. If farmers protest, that's it, because government knows next month they are buying no salary for the army. So it is very, very different across countries. So in Kenya, power, farmers are very powerful. The most powerful people in Kenya are farmers and teachers. If you go to other countries, it's different people. Now, compacts and these initiatives, what are they? There are too many of these things. Germany now and the G20 has three. In Nairobi last month, we had the Japanese one called Taikad. Then China has one called Fokak. Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, there must be like five or six partnership type things. If you have, if you are a government dealing like in our department, the treasury called the external resources, you probably need one desk to be dealing only with these things. I think we are going to suffer from partnership fatigue. <laughs> yeah, because the people who are coming up with them are competing. They are not coordinating, they are competing. This is what I'm calling the new mercantilism. It's the 19th century idea that you, know, you, you advance your cause by building trade surpluses with other countries and other parts of the world. So everybody wants to build a surplus with Africa. Yeah? Not understanding that really what you are looking for is to lift all boats, is, trade, is multilateralism. What happened to, a few, you know, a few years ago we were talking about multilateralism. Multilateralism is now dead. Everybody wants to cut private deals. With every, other, with every other region. So I think we are losing the big picture uh, of how globalization actually should work. And part of the reason we are losing it is a word which you used, which was used yesterday, is this infantilizing people. Thinking that uh, people need uh, your help and leadership. We don't need Europe's leadership. Uh, I think what we need is all of us to sit down and ask, how do we have, make this globalization work? Uh, for everybody. We don't need anybody's leadership to come and help us solve our problems. Uh, we can discuss about what investment opportunities are there and how those opportunities can be aligned with European interests. For instance, we know as economists that capital, globally, if you take a long-term view of capital, capital moves from where there is no a lot of capital relative to labor to places which have low capital relative to, low labor, whatever, relative to labor. Again, I said capital labor ratio. So Europe has capital surplus. That capital can only be, but its population is aging. It doesn't have many workers. That capital can only be invested in the parts of the world which have a growing labor force. So if you want high returns for European capital, and if you want to be able to pay your pensioners over the next 20 years, you have to invest in Africa and South Asia. Okay, now we can have that conversation. How do you invest in Africa and South Asia? But don't come tell us you have come to help us, because we are not stupid. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll s I promise a second round of questions and comments. Uh, as in the last panel, uh, uh, a short one. So we start over there. Mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tobias Panoffen from the Frankfurt School UNAP Collaborating Center. I have a question uh, with regards to what you said, David, uh, earlier, um, just at the, at the beginning of the uh, panel discussion with the phrase you, you labeled Africa, Africanization, uh, so that the, uh, the new allies become kind of part of the status quo, kind of, uh, yeah, grew into the, grew into the system. Um, which you compared with the BEE system in uh, in South Africa, um, I think that's really very uh, relevant, and of course uh, one can one can see that particularly in, in Kenya, probably president is one of the richest persons in uh, the country, uh, source of wealth, land um, that is not coming from nowhere, of course. Um, you said 
this is creating a lot of conflict of interests. Um, and I believe there are a lot of trickle down effects. So it's not only relating to the, to the president itself, but also to a lot of other areas, to a lot of other public stakeholders which are in the government. Um, and of course, these conflict of interest are not good for business, not good for international investors, but also not good for local investors. So my question is, what do you think can be done about it? Because it kind of feels like it is a self-sustaining circle. Um, if you don't have the money, you don't get president. If you are president, you are maintaining your, your wealth or even get richer and richer. And the next president uh, kind of has to uh, compare with Short that. Short question. So yeah, what can be done without it locally or with help? I only see one more question. If you want to um, say something, raise your hand now. OK, so there's one last question. My name is Frank. I have a question to you, to the Nigerian uh, people. Uh, can Nigeria introduce the technical I, I, can, can you, Nigeria introduce the technical equipment in the agriculture for uh, having uh, tractors, uh, uh, machines for producing more fruits in the agriculture? Thank you. So it was for Nigeria or Kenya, the question? Both, both. OK. Mm -hmm. I think the question was whether um, the Kenyan and um, Nigerian agricultural sector are able to incorporate um, automatization practically. Mm -hmm. So, okay, okay. Uh, the, the political economy question. That is where the rubber hits the road. In a country where public policy is captive, to these uh, sort of interests of local capital, which are aligned with whatever, that the only way to defeat it is to build broad-based political movements. And that's what we have now. If you look at our political cleavage, you have the current uh, Kenyatta government, which represents that class, and it talks about big infrastructure and big capital. And then you have the opposition side, where we try to mobilize more people, so you have money versus people. That's, that's the politics of Kenya today. I think you can simplify it. And that's a local contest. Uh, it, you see people shifting between sides. If you look at our, our politics has spanned out over the last 20 years, uh, in, uh, you, you have to compromise and, and try and see whether you can get progressive alliances. And you keep pushing it. You keep pushing it. You keep pushing it a little bit. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. Um, but obviously, even here in other countries, if you look at uh, uh, UK, for instance, which is where I'm familiar, it's the same butt lines, the conservatives and labor and, and all sorts of people. So we are evolving in that general direction, I think, the interests of capital and the interests of, of people which are a bit different. Now, does K Kenya use um, uh, mechanization and agriculture and, 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 and technology? Uh, that's a complex question. It varies a lot. First, as of now, even within our agriculture, if you look at global competitiveness of our agriculture, we are competitive in the agricultural products which, where labor is more at a premium. So we compete in high quality smallholder tea because you have to pick it by hand. If you pick it by machine, the quality goes down. So we don't compete in that market. We compete in the market where hand picking is at a premium. If you look at our fresh produce, uh, we are competitive in things also which require a lot of labor in handling, floriculture. You can't pick flowers by machine. But it's also a very high tech industry. If you look at uh, floriculture, because particularly of pesticides and all sorts of things, we have some of the most sophisticated biotechnology uh, mechanisms in uh, exporting. We export uh, like pest control technologies all over the world, but the industry itself is very labor intensive. So we cannot compete in large scale mechanized agriculture. Even our land ownership system, 
because it's small holder, people who own small pieces of land, mechanizing is, uh, is very difficult. But application of technology, even in small holder type of things, that uh, is, is quite, uh, you see that, that's how we are able to have a competitive, we are one of the largest uh, exporters of fresh uh, produce, like uh, fresh vegetables and things to Europe. Uh, and that comes from, um, from smallholder farmers with little plots of land because they are able to do a lot of very good quality without machines. If you introduce machines, they wouldn't be able to do it. And that's why we are struggling with the EPA because we are now cl classified as a developed country in Europe because we have a large market share of a particular segment and the other countries don't. Um, so that's the character of the agriculture. When we think about... I think yeah. That's, that's, so it varies. Nigeria is, I was going to say, Nigeria is, the, is at a different uh, stage. Just, just a very short, because I didn't make my homework, um, the free, free education, yes, no, very short. I, I think we didn't it's answer that question. Like the rest of them, it's a hybrid. Mm, okay. uh, but we probably have done a bit better in terms of quality of the public education mm. across the board. But it's very, it consumes 40% of our budget. And as I said, the most powerful people in Kenya are teachers. Okay. Uh, so the lobby for putting more money in education in Kenya is, is very strong, so that helps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, for Nigeria. farming in Nigeria, we uh, have small-scale subsistence farms right across the country. 80% of the rural population is agricultural. So mechanizing is not really there, but the potential to be mechanized is there. It is possible to have aggregates of small farms come together and be mechanized to increase productivity. But we also can scale our production as it is today because we incur about 750 billion loss, post-harvest loss every year on fruits and vegetables alone. So it is the numbers that are in the farming uh, sector that make that difference. So if the question is because if you're asking whether we can be food secure without being mechanized, yes, we can, because of the numbers that we have. But there are some mechanized farms that exist. They are privately owned by you know, rich individuals. And the idea that we have going forward to have food security and to, to substitute our imports is to have some mechanized farming, which is more attractive to the young ones. There is a young guy who is quoted on the Forbes, the African Forbes magazine, as having the second largest rice farm uh, in Nigeria and you know, making a lot of money from that. So that's the way we want to go eventually. We can be mechanized, but as of now, we are not mechanized in general. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd like to close with, with two remarks. The, f the first one is I'd like to remind all of us, and that's something uh, that came out in the discussion yesterday at night, um, that Africa is not Africa, and it's about very different countries and contexts. You, you said that as well. I'd like to remind ourselves that um, South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria are, in terms of macro macroeconomic data, the, the richest countries uh, in Africa. So maybe the things we talked about now won't work in other places, probably. So there's, there's more to learn. Uh, and it wasn't repre representative, but I think very um, impressive and helpful what we heard. And second, I'm, as I said, I was at the T20 summit the last two days and we had the big African delegation and we had the deputy uh, chair of the African Commission there as well. And one, one, of a, one constant theme during these conversations was a call for African intellectual leadership. So African participants said, if we, if we want to take development in our hands, if it's about ownership, it's about African intellectual leadership and not, not foreign plans. And I'm really honored that I was on a panel today that really showed this uh, very African intellectual leadership. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs>